But I, I'm, we just have to keep the faith that everything will go well, and uh, it'll be a great day for, for this area. Yes, sir. Question. Is the uh, Secret Service going to do background checks on the people who are going to attend that? Uh, they do. They have a, we have a, <coughs> it's always oh, very tight. If you're on the list to get in, and you go to a certain site where you have to be there at a certain time, uh, they hand you the ticket as you're escorted to the bus. Had, and the bus takes you up to the single entrance that goes right into the debate hall. Uh, they, they, this is how tight it is. They didn't even want to have the bus have to turn around. We had to come up with an area where the bus doesn't back up. Um, they've had some problems in the past. If you remember, there was one debate where a um, a student had a ticket and he gave his gave it a sold his ticket uh, to a Ralph Nader, uh, the, the campaign director Ralph Nader. Ralph Nader was not invited, and he created a disturbance inside the debate hall once the debate started and had to be escorted out. I think they remember that uh, disturbance, and uh, so to keep that from happening, they are real restrictive on when they give you a ticket, they verify. It, so that, that you're the appropriate ticket holder and they escort you to the bus and take you directly in. And um, they have, we have to provert, provide lots of volunteers at all these locations. Uh, all those have to be checked out, background checks. And the Secret Service does all of that with their technology now. They do it pretty rapidly. So, yes, sir. What time does the county take right? We, we won't know that, and they don't tell us that. Um, constantly asked, where will the candidates stay? We don't know. Uh, will they be here overnight? We don't know. Uh, the campaigns may know. The campaigns may have uh, events. The campaigns have, have reserved spots around town for parties and, and events, but whether the candidates will be there, we don't know. Uh, we would like to know because we would like to, to add that to um, the big donors them to go and at least shake hands with the candidates. That should increase our our attractiveness for donations. <laughs> they won't tell us that. Um, so we don't, we don't know that. <laughs> yes, Ron? What kind of long-term benefits do you see from the university? Other than physical structure? Yes. Physical changes? Because we'll make a lot of changes to the campus that will be beneficial. Um, all these other universities have reported a slight uptick in, in um, enrollment the next year. Not much. Uh, all of the stories that we will get, this, this is our opportunity to tell the world that the University of Mississippi has students from all 50 states, 65 foreign countries, some nationally known research programs here, this is our chance to show the world that we are an international player on the world's higher education stage. We're not just a little regional institution, that we are among the great public universities. This is an opportunity to, to tell that. And as I tell folks, you know, live in the moment. We've already gotten huge publicity. And I can't tell you the number of big executives I've taken around the campus and to a person, they say, this is the best kept secret in America. And I was talking to one the other day, he said, how much does it, go, does it cost to go here? And I said, well, if you live in state, that's $5,000. Five, that's five he said, $5,000 a semester. I said, no, a year. He said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so the story getting out, this is our opportunity to also show that we have addressed the racial issue that Ole Miss is, is known for a lot outside of the, of, uh, the South. Um, you, know, you see any kind of reference to Ole Miss usually starts off with the riot, the 1962 riot. This is an opportunity for us to show, and, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions about race. Here, here you have the history of Ole Miss and the first uh, African American to ever run for president in U.S. history, and the first debate the one that's the most watched is here at the University of Mississippi. So I'm sure we already have had a lot of questions about how have you dealt with the, 
at the racial incident that occurred, the pivotal event in civil rights history that occurred here in September of 62. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity to address that. Every member of the press will receive a press packet that has in there things that like that, what we've done. Uh, our experts on campus in the various, <laughs> we get to hit them twice because they changed on us. They told us that our topic would be domestic. So most of these 53 events here have to do with the domestic issues. And we had identified our experts on campus in the various domestic issues. And then the commission calls one morning at a quarter to eight while I'm moving my daughter in, freshman daughter into a dorm and says, got some news for you. We're going to change. Y'all are going to do the foreign affairs. I said, well, we're going to have but 16 courses and 53 related events around domestic issues. <laughs> Other than that, should be no problem. <laughs> and they said, well, this will give you an opportunity. They said, they're all issues that will be discussed, so don't worry about it. Proceed with what you've done. And uh, if you can identify some experts on campus in foreign affairs, do that and put that in the press packet. So that but long-term effects uh, I don't know I've talked to some universities that said it increased their contributions uh, increased their enrollment um, but other than that nobody really remembers that the debate was held on that site eight years later so um, but we thought it was worth it, and we still do